The Lord be with you. <laughs> if there's one I'm sure he is with. Yeah, it's, it's well right now. I needed that. Thank you. We're listening this morning to the 17th chapter of Exodus. Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages, as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you, and in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it, so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massah and Meribah, because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit, be with us. God, be with us now as we listen, as we listen for your voice speaking to us through Holy Scripture. Help us, O God, not to hear my voice, as it is so often so easy to do, but to hear yours. Free us of whatever distractions and filters we may have with us so that we may hear you speak to us clearly and speak to us fully, encouraging us, lifting us up, challenging us, but Lord, always speaking to us as you are with us. So, Lord, be with us now as we listen for you, and may you speak. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. If there is one word to describe the Israelites during their post-Egyptian wilderness wandering, it would be grumbling. In fact, the Hebrew word often translated as grumbling, murmuring, complaining, whining, etc. occurs throughout the story of the Israelites' time in the desert, after their exodus from Egypt, and on even into the promised land. Too often they sound like irritable children in the back seat of a station wagon on a road trip to Grandma's house. Are we there yet? I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. I don't want to stop here. How much longer? Are we there yet? I wish we could have just stayed home. I have a Nintendo. I didn't want to go in the first place. Or as I often hear from the back seat of our candy car, I want a piece of candy. Piece of candy. Of course, kids in the back seat on the way to Grandma's house aren't irritable towards Grandma, are they? They're not upset that Grandma had to live so far away. No, they're irritable towards the ones in the front seat. The ones steering the car, the ones reading the map, listening as they might to the GPS. The Israelites weren't much different. When they began to complain, to murmur, to grumble, they didn't take it up with the one who decided that the promised land was on the other side of the desert. They grumbled to the one in the front seat, to the one at the head of the crowd, the one who led them out of Egypt, the one who led them through the Red Sea, the one who stood up to Pharaoh and was now leading them across this desert. We've witnessed one of those grumbling incidents, not the first one by far, but one of them this morning in this chapter from Exodus. 
Right away we're told that from the wilderness of sin, now that's not the, the same sin, that we're, that's the Canaanite moon goddess sin, and this just happened to be the area that was named for her. From the wilderness of sin, we're told the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages, by groups, as the Lord commanded, and they finally camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for them to drink. Now, this isn't the first time that the people have camped where there was no water for them to drink. In fact, you can just flip over maybe a page or two in your Bible and read all about what happened at Marah in chapter 15, verses 22 through 27. But it's also not the first time the Israelites found themselves without a necessity in the wilderness. You don't have to turn maybe at all. You can simply read all of chapter 16 to see how God provided them with food. Mana, the what's this stuff? bread in the wilderness. Yet here they are again, probably still picking it out of their teeth. And here we go. Rather than having learned from the experiences thus far in the wilderness, rather than trusting God who had provided for them in verse 2, they quarreled with Moses. With Moses, the one in the front seat. Give us water to drink. We're thirsty. They whined like little children in the back seat. Isn't it something how they still haven't learned that God will provide their needs? Isn't it something that these people who've witnessed the power of Yahweh, the power of God in the face of the most powerful empire in the world, are still complaining? Isn't it something that these people who've witnessed not one, not two, not three, but ten plagues, ten signs from God, that they would still whine about something as simple as water to drink. Isn't it something that these people, these people who left Egyptian slavery in droves by the thousands, these same people who passed through a parted sea, these same people who were just eating bread that miraculously appeared on the ground that morning, are still not over there grumbling, whining, complaining, and quarreling with Moses. You know, it's a wonder to me that Moses one night didn't tap Aaron on the shoulder, wake him up from sleep, hand him the stick, say, it's on you now, buddy, and walk right out. You would think by now these people would have their stuff together. That they'd understand that God had brought them out there, and God obviously didn't bring them out there to die. You would think by now, with these great signs of power and wonder in Egypt still fresh on their minds, that these people would understand everything's going to work out. God has provided for them on more than one occasion already, so there's no reason to believe God wouldn't do it again. You'd think that. You'd think they'd have it figured out. But, truth is, I'm just like them. Maybe you are too. Maybe we shouldn't be too quick to judge them after all. I mean, think about it. When I think about how many times have I found myself in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of a trial, in the midst of something overwhelming, seemingly impossible to handle, yet here I am, somehow, some way, made it through, in the midst of it, thought, man, I'm never going to make it. I'm going to pull all my hair out. I'm going to just end it all. I don't know. I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. And then here I am. God delivered me. God brought me through the wilderness. Wonder if he's done that for you. Wonder how God has provided for you in those ways. I'm sure, though, if you're like me, when the next challenge came, what did you do? When the next dark day came along, there's that still, still that feeling of lingering doubt. Maybe, maybe I won't get through it this time. I might not make it this time. God might not be there for me this time. But he does. You see, I'm convinced that fear, that, that, that doubt, that uncertainty, I'm convinced it's a crucial part of the life of faith. I mean, what if the story we read this morning read a little differently? What if it had gone something like this? From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So the people all said to one another, don't sweat it. God will give us some water. That's God's job, after all, to make sure we get everything we need. 
So the people waited with their heads held up towards the sky, their mouths open, waiting for God to rain down water for them to drink. What if it had read like that? It's a bit silly to think maybe, but, but think about it this way. Without a healthy dose of uncertainty, without the questioning if, if one's soul, in one's soul of whether or not God will provide, one, one may be tempted to begin to see God as little more than a sacred supply source, giving you everything you need in order to be healthy and whole, but nothing more. You see, I'm convinced faith, faith without that little bit of uncertainty, becomes nothing more than holy entitlement. With one believing, he or she will get whatever he or she wants because God will give it to them. Because that's what God's supposed to do, we think. God had a plan for Moses in order to provide water for the people. And God used that opportunity to once again show the people that God would provide for them their every need in the wilderness. But they would still grumble, they would still complain to Moses, and they would still doubt. Never fails. There's not a single time, not a single instance, when God provides and all the people go, oh, and then they never complain again. If it's not one group, it'd be another one. It never fails all throughout the story. They will still grumble, they still complain, and they still doubt it. But that uncertainty would lead to God showing them the way. Showing them God's providence even in the desert. And maybe that's why, why Moses commemorated their quarreling and their testing of God by renaming the place where they were, not once, but twice. To remind them of their, their quarreling and their testing, their asking of the question, is the Lord among us or not? Maybe the people weren't supposed to be the ones who were learning. Perhaps Moses was the one who was beginning to learn. Perhaps he was beginning to understand that faith in God's providence requires a helping of uncertainty to test one's dependence upon God. Perhaps the real testing that took place at Rephidim was not the Israelites' testing of God, but God's testing of the people and Moses' faith. Because after all, faith untested is faith unproven. And that makes us nervous. We don't want our faith tested. We want it to just be. But faith untested is faith unproven. And so the people ask. And so we ask. Is the Lord among us or not? To me, the answer to that question is not as plain and dry cut as it may seem to others. Because you see, to me, God is not simply some far off energy source, driving creation while making sure the right people get everything they want. God is one who exists in relationships. God is a living, moving, loving God. To me, that means there is more to the life of faith than a simplistic notion that God will hand us everything. That God will hand over everything I need and will see me through the dark valleys of life like some, some giant de uh, uh, deity who treats us like marionette puppets. Oh, they go over in the mountain, they go down in the valley. No, I don't believe that. To ask if the Lord is among us or not is to ask if God is actually there with us in the dry places of the desert? Is God actually with us down in those dark valleys or on top of the mountain? Is God with us is not to ask, is God got everything on the end of the string for us? It's to ask, is God there down in the mud with us? It's to ask if God can actually experience our thirst. If God can actually feel our pain, know our loneliness. It's to ask if God can even know our doubts and our fears, and not just in a cognitive way of like, I know what you doubt, but to really experience them. To know about the uncertainty we feel when we can't see the road ahead. And on this third Sunday in Lent, the answer comes back 
from Christ on the cross. And it says, yes, the Lord is with us. For there upon the cross, Christ, God incarnate, cries out in his thirst. God, can you feel my thirst? Yes. Cries out in his fear of uncertainty. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Can you feel it, God? Yes. Christ offers himself up in the ultimate act of faith in the midst of his own doubt and despair. And we wonder, is the Lord with us or not? And every time, every time, From the cross, he says, yes. Sometime after, after the cross, after the grave, after even the empty tomb, Jesus says to those who are with him, I am with you always. Is the Lord with us or not? Yes. And not, not in some ways, and he peeps his head in to check in on us every once in a while, gazing down on us from some throne in the sky. But God is with us in the midst of it. We wonder, how are we going to make it through? He made it through, and he takes us through with him. Is God with us or not? Every single time, the answer is yes. He is with us because Christ has been there before us. Christ has been in the dark valleys. Christ has been there in the dry desert. God in Christ has been there and God will be there again today, tomorrow, the day after, on through eternity. God will always be with us. And we will doubt. We will complain. We will murmur. We will aim our arrows at the closest targets and let let the bow fly. We will fear, but Christ will be with us regardless. And like the Israelites of so long ago, if we listen, if we truly listen to Christ from the cross, we will grow in faith and trust along this journey because the Lord goes with us. We're not out here like blind hogs looking for an acre. God is with us. And the answer is and always will be when we ask, is the Lord among us or not? The answer is always yes. Let us pray. Holy God, you are with us even now. Lord, we trust you are with those who are not with us. We trust, God, that when the way is dark, Lord, we trust when the way is brightly lit and the path is clear, that you are with us. That when there is no water in the desert, You are with us. When there is no light in the darkness, you are with us. When there is more joy than we can contain, you are with us. When the winds blow in our favor, or when they seek to crash our ships upon the rocks, you are with us. Holy God, as we trust that, we trust you are with us even now. (laughs) And Lord, we trust that you speak to us still. So God, help us to hear. Help us to hear you now as you call us out. As you call us out further and further from that doubt and uncertainty that clouds our judgments. As you call us out, Lord, into the joy that you have for us in following you. Lord, help us to trust that you are here and that we'll, Lord, that we may hear you. So speak now, holy God, we pray. In the name above all names, the name we speak when we know you are always with us.
name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.